If you're watching this, then you are presumably a living, breathing survivor of the zombie apocalypse. However, if you are watching this and there has been no zombie apocalypse, then please stop watching now and return to your usual business. Zombies don't exist and so do not pose a threat to you. So please, once again, stop watching now and return to your carefree lives. But if you did want to stock up on tin foods and shotguns, nobody would think any less of you. Just saying. However, it is far more likely that you are an erstwhile survivor inhabiting an apocalyptic wasteland containing a large number of neurocannibalistic, post-mortal, quasi-pathogen motivated individuals, or in lay terms, zombies. If this is the case, well done. Then let me first congratulate you on your tenacity, which has allowed you to remain an intact homo sapiens in the face of extreme adversity. Logic suggests that you're also a resourceful and intelligent person, in that you have survived, but also managed to acquire a viable power source and working media system on which to play this video. Your survival instincts and technical skills are clearly self-evident. Extrapolating further, these cognitive abilities suggest that you are in possession of an efficient and highly functioning brain. In your situation, this can be seen as both a positive and a negative. A high-functioning brain means you have a greater ability to cope with and adapt to the wide variety of dangers and challenges that a zombie-infested post-apocalyptic environment will present you with. However, as a negative, zombies are known for their relentless pursuit of living human brains, so yours would likely be seen as a particularly desirable specimen, meaning you are subject to more zombie-based threats than your average brained person would be. However, your brain can be your secret weapon. By knowing and understanding the workings of the psyche, brain and nervous system, you can increase your odds of long-term survival when dealing with this oh so persistent walking dead. So what follows are some simple tips from the field of neuroscience for engaging with zombies. For an average person, the previous clip should have been somewhat alarming. The unexpected and intense nature of the stimulus, helped in part by the visceral, visual and audio components, should have caused a sympathetic nervous system reaction. Amongst other things, your adrenal gland should have flooded your system with adrenaline, exciting your fight or flight response. On a side note, as humans are clearly unable to actually fly, I have campaigned for the fight or flight response to be renamed the violence or vacate response. Uh, this is more appropriate as it covers the option of vacating the premises or vacating your bowels, both of which are popular choices for humans in danger. As of 2012, however, my efforts uh, remain unsuccessful. When experiencing this fight or flight response, a human will undergo sensitization, where uh, typically inoculous stimuli elicit extreme responses. The creak of the floorboard turns from something familiar and ignorable into a potential axe-wheeling psychopath that has been hiding in your ear and cupboard. In lay terms, uh, adrenaline is causing you to react to any and all stimuli as if it is a threat. As inconvenient and excessive as this sounds, it is a useful evolved mechanism. When presented with a dangerous stimulus in an unfamiliar situation, anything can turn out to be a hazard, so humans have evolved this mechanism to react accordingly when in dangerous situations. On the opposite end of the innate response spectrum is the tendency to become habituated to stimulus. The more we encounter something, the more familiar it becomes, and the less reaction we have to it, to the point where we don't react to it at all. Even the most noxious stimuli can become normal over time. For example, Andrew Lloyd Webb has become viewed as a household figure, rather than a Lovecraftian horror. The risk is that, in a zombie-infested environment, encountering an undead individual, desperate to devour your brains, may become a mundane occurrence, dulling your fight-or-flight response, and thus preventing you from behaving appropriately when faced with this mortal threat. Even before Armageddon occurred, Western society was well on the way to making zombies an everyday occurrence. So in order to avoid this and keep your alertness and wits about you during a zombie attack, it is important that you occasionally pair a zombie encounter with another unpleasant stimulus in order to maintain useful levels of aversion. You should ensure that during some zombie encounters you experience something unpleasant in order to maintain your fight or flight response. Direct encounters with zombies often prove to be fatal, so it's best not to actually rely on the zombie themselves to provide the unpleasant stimulus. If you are lucky enough to be travelling with another survivor, arrange for them to, during zombie attacks, randomly provide you with an unpleasant stimulus. It could be a small to moderate electric shock, an injection of some low-level poison, or have them criticise some personal flaws that you are quite sensitive about. 
The person you are travelling with may argue that a zombie attack is not the time or place for such things, but this is not the case. If necessary, offer to poison a shock or upset them in return. I'm sure they'll understand and be grateful. However, if you travel alone, you should attempt to poison, shock or insult yourself at any given opportunity. Remember, it doesn't work nearly as well if you can anticipate it. Surprise is key to this sort of conditioning. So if you do have to poison yourself, don't let yourself know when you're going to do it. This is very important. If you follow this advice, you should eventually exist in a perpetual state of low-level hysteria, the ideal condition for reacting promptly and appropriately when confronted with zombies. However, if you do end up looting a pharmacy for supplies, be sure to pick up some blood pressure medication, just in case. When navigating through an environment filled with zombies, it's important to remain unnoticed. But how is this achieved? A normal human has superior speed, dexterity and cognitive skills, so why do they keep getting caught and eaten by zombies? One explanation is that zombies possess a sensory ability that stunned humans do not, and are thus unaware of any requirement to counteract. Zombies, being former humans usually, are logically in possession of the standard human senses to a certain extent. Let's go for those. Vision. Vision is the dominant human sense with up to 65% of a working brain being linked to the visual system in some way. Therefore, the energy demands and complexity of the visual system are very high. The shambolic locomotion and lack of dexterity of a typical zombie, coupled with a seemingly voracious appetite for flesh, suggests that they have poorly functioning brains on a diet that scarcely provides sufficient calories to maintain whatever met metabolic processes they rely on. Zombies also rarely attack or devour other zombies, despite the fact that the differences between zombies and living humans are superficial, at least from the perspective of a less sophisticated visual system. And yet, zombies are clearly capable of differentiating between other zombies and humans and pursuing the latter, which suggests that they are using a sense other than vision. Hearing. It could be argued that a zombie may be using hearing to locate and pursue humans. A zombie would likely still be able to perceive vibrations in the air, and their eardrums, cochlear and associated neuronal systems would still be in place if they hadn't rotted too far. However, one of the signature behaviours of zombies which makes them a considerable threat is that they hang around in large groups. Zombies are not renowned for treading lightly and will emit persistent moans and groans as they shamble along en masse. A surviving human in a zombie infested environment will, by way of contrast, attempt to go unnoticed, which includes keeping audible noise to a minimum. For zombies to audibly detect a single creeping human while surrounded by a mass of moaning, creaking, lurching bodies seems unlikely. Admittedly, sometimes surviving humans can emit the sounds of gunfire and hysterical screaming, but this usually occurs only after they have been found and attacked by zombies, who are rarely, if ever, deterred by the excessive noise they encounter in such situations. All of this suggests that zombies do not rely on a sense of hearing. Taste. Zombies are primarily known for their insatiable desire for human flesh. Whether this is due to them perceiving it as having a very pleasant taste or purely for metabolic energy is uncertain. The fact remains that taste is logically not a sense that can be used to detect a target from a distance. If you are at some point where a zombie is tasting you, pondering precisely how it managed to locate you should probably be a relatively low priority. Smell Smell is one of the most basic of human senses, the first to develop embryologically, the most poorly understood in terms of how airborne particles are translated into electrical signals in the nervous system. It is also the sense used most often by predatory creatures for detecting prey. If zombies have effectively regressed to a more primitive form of human life, it is likely that the smell will be a more dominant sense. It is also likely that living humans give off pheromones or other chemical signals that decaying zombies do not. Ergo, it is likely that zombies are able to track humans by sense of smell. It is clear that zombies do not cause a zombie's sense of smell to recognise them as a potential food source. Other zombies do not smell like food to a single zombie. Logically, in order to avoid detection, you must smell like a zombie. Zombies are made up primarily of rotten human flesh. Ergo, to smell like a zombie, you should smell like dead human flesh. If you are a survivor in an apocalyptic wasteland, this should not be difficult to obtain. Simply regularly coat yourself in a generous layer of decomposing matter and this should eventually mask the odour of living tissue that you are persistently giving off. Granted, this may make uh, being part of a group and travelling along as, with another band of survivors more difficult, but this should not remain a problem for very long. Admittedly, there may be a specific chemical signal being released by dead tissue that, if detected by a zombie, stops them from attacking you. However, what this may be is uncertain. Before society collapsed, those who had extensive experience of smelling corpses were rarely allowed to contribute to scientific research. 
Uh, this may seem naive now, and for that we apologise. There are several possible mechanisms by which zombies are created and propagated. Exactly what mechanism is responsible for the zombies you encounter may prove useful in how you respond to them, and thus ensure your further survival. There are many recognisable characteristics of zombies which aid in recognising them. The poor movement, unintelligible vocalisations and low dexterity are all indications of a shutdown in higher brain function. The ability to walk, move and perform basic biological functions suggests that the spinal cord and brainstem retain their function to a certain extent, but the poor coordination, dexterity and inability to communicate beyond slaughtering potential food sources reveal a considerable shutdown in higher brain areas such as the neocortex and limbic system. If you are attacked by a zombie, there are essentially two possible outcomes that are to be avoided. Becoming a zombie yourself, or becoming food for a zombie. Which of the two is likely to happen to you on encountering a zombie depends on exactly what type of zombie you are dealing with. It is possible to work this out from clues offered by the vocalizations they make. Your zombie may sound like this. <laughs> Note this type of vocalisation has hints of and suggestions of structure, perhaps indicating distress or another emotional state. Even this low level of complexity suggests the involvement of the language processing areas in the frontal lobes, part of the neocortex, which is clearly indicative of higher brain function still persisting. This is likely to be the result of the zombified individual being under the control of a parasite or similar organism, which is actively keeping the host in the corpse-like state. It suggests that the host individual is still experiencing higher brain function which is being suppressed or scrambled by the parasite. If encountering a zombie like this, it is likely that the parasite is keeping the higher functions of the host intact in order to aid mobility and coordination, in order to locate and incapacitate other potential hosts to ensure a spread of the parasite. This parasite could be anything, virus, bacterium, head crab, or something else hitherto unknown to science. If encountering a zombie that sounds like this, it is likely that a single bite or other infectious action will spread the pathogen and convert it to a zombie, so please keep your distance. Other zombies may sound more like this. Similar sounding perhaps, but a more guttural, simple sound. This is likely less the product of a sophisticated speech processing than it is A escaping from overly inflated lungs and a poorly coordinated vocal system. This is not indicative of high-functioning individual under the control of an aggressive parasite, but a deceased individual reanimated by some dominant pathogen previously unencountered by science. The movement and vocalizations appear as they do because the pathogen is reactivating basic systems, such as the brainstem and spinal cord, to allow locomotion, but lacks the complex higher functions that support normal human movement and speech. This reveals that the pathogen has the ability to manipulate and activate neuronal tissue, which suggests that it requires neuronal tissue to survive, its primary goal would be to obtain more in order to ensure its further survival, which would explain the zombie's penchant for human brains. Presumably, deceased neuronal tissue is unsuitable for the pathogen's survival. Exactly how you extract live neural tissue from a host without immediately converting them to deceased tissue is uh, uncertain, but nobody said pathogens had to be smart. This would also explain why zombies seem so relentless. Encountering a zombie like this may give you more scope for action as they are likely to be slower and less coordinated, and the pathogen propelling them is likely to be less communicable so a single bite is not a significant threat outside of their infection and injury risk. Any brain activity is likely to be a byproduct of the actions of the pathogen. Finally, there are some creatures that demonstrate no brain activity whatsoever. They sound something like this. It isn't all fun being a test driver, though. Before a car is launched, these guys take it to the vast heat of Arizona and the icy wastes of northern Sweden. Zombies of this sort may seem dangerous, but are sustained only by tension. Deny them this and they will move on and harass some other survivors, possibly female or immigrant ones. Given their characteristics, it is believed by some that the zombies are humans that have undergone some strange process of evolutionary regression referenced earlier. The desire for raw meat, the reduced cognitive capacity, having no qualms with violence, the resistance to da damage and surprising strength, the formation of primitive social groups. These could be viewed as similar behaviours to early hominids. Some fringe groups argue that the insatiable desire for meat, tendency to kill anything they see, and inadequate harm movements is more in indicative of Tyrannosaurus rex than early hominids. But these fringe groups accuse everyone of being a lizard at some point, so let's not take everything they say as a viable theory. Regardless of the extent or specific details, the theory that the zombie pathogen, whatever it may be, brings about the well-known characteristics due to a form of evolutionary regression is an interesting one. 
as a zombie for its survivor, you may find this information more in the realm of intellectual musings rather than useful guidance. However, consider the following. Many anthropologists believe that it was the invention of cooking that accelerated human cognitive development. The act of heating meat to such an extent that it was easier to digest provided much greater nutrition, allowing enough fuel for our metabolically demanding larger brains to develop. In their default state, zombies are slow-moving, relatively mentally impaired creatures. They subsist on a diet of raw flesh. If we take the previous facts to be accurate, the concern is that if zombies somehow take a diet of cooked flesh, then their cognitive skills could enhance too, making them considerably more dangerous and render all the previous tips moot. Exactly how one obtains living flesh that is cooked is uncertain, as the states are not compatible when it comes to living tissue. However, caution is ever the best option. So, if one of your companions happen to catch fire, put him out as soon as possible. Whether you take put him out to mean extinguish the flames, or put him out of his misery, is up to you. It would probably depend on the context of the time. So there you have it. In order to survive a zombie apocalypse, simply follow the simple neuroscientific tips laid out in this video. To summarize, keep yourself alert and paranoid at all times. Make sure you smell like rotten flesh. Listen to how the zombies talk and react accordingly. If you or a companion catch fire, ensure that you or they are dead before you get eaten. Follow these tips to the letter, and eventually you'll be a paranoid, twitchy, sleep-deprived, shambling individual who smells like rotten flesh, listens to the undead, and is constantly taking human lives. In no time at all, you'll fit right in to this new zombie-infested society. If you have found this video useful, you may want to check out alternative titles, such as Sick as a Dog, a biomedical analysis of the effects of werewolf bites, Hemoglobalization, sociological advice on integrating into a vampire society, and Binary for Beginners, effective communication with our machine overlords. Thank you for watching and happy hunting.